A feature that we've been waiting for years for is finally integrated in Blender 2.66, and that is full rigid body support in the viewport. So previously with Blender, we had to do rigid body simulations via the game engine, which we could then bake out to keyframes for use in the viewport for animations or anything like that. But this was a very cumbersome way. You didn't really get a lot of flexibility if you wanted to say like a, an animated character that to then interact with rigid body objects within your physics simulation, you couldn't really do this. But now, luckily, rigid bodies are completely integrated as a simulation system in Blender 2.66, and we've got full interaction. So now you can have characters that interact with physical objects. You can have uh, cloth simulations interact with physical objects. And you've got much, much greater control. And so, for example, I can do something like this very, very simple, simply and easily. Now, this is a pretty simple simulation. It's just a whole bunch of icospheres falling into a, a shallow bowl, followed by another large icosphere, then kind of smashing the bowl over and throwing them everywhere. And this simulation literally takes less than five minutes to set up, but previously would have been a bit of a pain using the old system. But now this is just integrated directly into the 3D view. So real quick, rather than showing you how this one works, let's just start a new file and I'm gonna show you how quick and easy it is to set up. So if I just take my, my default cube here, let's just go here in the toolbar, scroll down, and you can see rigid body tools right here. So if I just click add active, an active object is one that is going to basically interact with gravity. So it's going to fall, it's gonna collide with other objects, etc. So I'll just click add active and that's all. If I now hit alt eight for one, you'll see it's been added to a group as indicated by the green outline. And so the rigid body system basically uses some groups to to understand what belongs to what and so that you can have objects interacting with each other. And so if I just hit Alt-A to play back the animation, you can see that my cube now falls down and that's all fine and dandy. But now if I want my cube to interact with another object, let's just hit Shift-A, add in a plane. We'll scale this plane up times 10. We'll move it down a little bit. And then let's just hit Control-A to apply the scale. You notice since I scaled in object mode, my scale right here is now 10 to 10 to 10. And this means that Blender thinks basically this is a scale of one that's just been multiplied times 10. So I need to hit control A and apply that scale. In general, just for consistency and to make sure you don't have any problems, your scales with rigid body objects should be one to one to one, unless you have a specific reason otherwise. And now if I simply add this one as a passive object, such that objects can collide with it, but it's not going to fall or anything like that, I can now hit Alt A, and now my cube will just fall directly onto my plane. If I just go back, Let's take my cube, we'll move it up a little bit. Let's just double tap R, give it some funky rotation like this and hit Alt-A again. And now it's going to fall and bounce and whatnot. Very, very cool. So really quick and easy to set up our simulations. Let's just show this a little bit more. If we just take this, let's duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Maybe rotate these a little bit for some variation. Hit Alt-A and there we go all of our cubes are interacting falling away from each other and everything is fine and dandy but now what if we say you know what i want one of these cubes to be a smaller size so we'll scale this down we'll apply the scale and then maybe this one will be a lot larger we'll apply that scale um, but maybe these are also different materials. Well, if we go and look at the physics buttons and you notice that we now have a new rigid body object that's been added via this, here are all of the individual settings for this specific rigid body. So I can see I've got a mass of one. It's using a convex hull as the collision shape. We've got all of our other options to refine the collision a little bit more. Uh, we've got surface response. We've got sensitivity. We can add things to groups. So for example, if I add this one to collision group two, the cubes are gonna completely ignore it because they're no longer sharing a group. Um, and we've got all of our other settings that we can use to fine tune our simulation. Now I'm not gonna go into these, you know, you can dig these into a little bit further. I just wanna talk about the, the basics of getting started. But so all of these have the exact same mass, even though the size is different. So what we can do is if we just select all of these, we go over here to the tools and these all act, act on all selected objects, not just the, the primary selection. And if we now click calculate mass, we can choose the, to calculate the mass based on the size of the object and the type of material that we want. So in this case, let's just say these are cast iron blocks. So these are really, really heavy. So I click cast iron and you can see it's calculated the mass for each one of these. So now this one has a mass of, what is that? 409,829.531. Whereas this one is just a fraction of that. So now if I hit alt a, you can see them fall and they interact more realistically. Uh, 
And so you can do this with any number of things. You notice that we have the calculate mass for a lot of very common materials, everything from iron to lead to charcoal to cork, uh, bronze, brass, soft brick, common brick, pressed brick, etc. So we've got a lot of different options in here that work really, really well. All right, well, let's see. Uh, we've got a couple other things. So like if we say go in here, we change a whole bunch of settings and then we realize, wow, I really wanted those settings to apply to all of these. We can simply select all these and then select this one and click uh, copy from active. So if I copy from active, it'll copy all of these settings, including the mass to all of these. So now they're all identical again. Um, we can also take our simulation, say if we do something like this, and then if we bake that to keyframes, we can set our start and end. We'll just set this to say 20 and click OK, and it bakes those to keyframes. And so now we've got actual keyframes of our simulation, which wasn't a whole lot initially. And it also only baked it for my selected object. And so you can see that these ones are still simulated, but then this one has actual keyframes. Now, in this case, I'm going to go in and I'm just going to clear those keyframes. And I'm just going to add active again. So if you, know, you want to bake down an animation to make sure that it's exactly consistent, you know, you've got your simulation down right, and now you're using it in a short film or anything like that, then you can bake it to keyframes. And the next thing and last thing that I want to show you is connections. So real quick, let's just add in another plane. We're going to scale this up and then apply it. And then I'm going to add in a, a bar. So think of this like, you know, it could be a high bar. It could be really kind of anything, but basically just a elongated cylinder that we're going to use to um, basically collide our objects with. So something like this, and then maybe we'll do something like that. And then I'm going to apply my scale. And now let's, let's imagine that we're creating a chain or something like that. So I'm going to have, you know, a chain of objects, say something like this, that then is going to fall down and wrap around that bar. Well, the way that we can do this is by using connections or constraints. So we can see connect right here. So let's just go and let's add in a mesh and an icosphere. And this icosphere, we're just going to pull up. We're going to scale it down a little bit, and then we're going to apply that scale. And in fact, actually, let's go ahead and bring it over like this. And then let's hit Shift D, move it along the Y axis like this, and then just hit Shift R a whole bunch of times, say something like that, to then just repeat that last step. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, we're going to take all of these objects, and let's first go in, let's add active, and then let's change the type to be spheres. This way they're all going to interact like spheres. And now let's take this object and this object, and I want to connect them. Basically, I want to give them a joint through which to rotate. So let's just hit connect, and you can see immediately it's added a new empty right here. And let's change the type. By default, I think it's set to fixed. We're just going to use hinge. You can see the different types we have here. And let's just make sure that the lo location is center. This just ensures that our hinge point, basically the point of rotation, is at the center between these two objects. And now let's just repeat this process for each one of these. So we'll connect this. We'll connect these ones. And you can technically do this for all of them at the same time, but just in my experience when doing this, I found it seems to be a little bit inconsistent and you'll get like connections that aren't centered and the objects just aren't connected right. And so I, it's, I found it to be much more reliable just to do individuals at a time. And there we go. So now all of these objects are connected. And if we select one of these constraints, we can go and look at it in the physics tab. We have a new rigid body constraint. You can see the type, it's enabled, collisions are disabled, and then it's connecting object one and object two. And in this case, this is object one, or this is object two, this is object one. And so it's basically these two objects are going to rotate around each other based on this point of rotation. And now if I just hit all day, like this, it's gonna hit, I'm gonna play it, and they're just going to fall right through because currently I haven't set these. So this one is gonna be passive, and this one is gonna be passive. There we go. Now I hit all day again, and now it kind of interacts and acts almost like a rope around this object, and that's really, really cool. But you'll notice a couple of things. For one, the way that it rotated around was kind of weird. It didn't seem to kind of bend it. It's kind of like it had to twist first. And that's actually exactly what happened because the hinge, just like a real hinge, doesn't rotate always. You know, it's not like a ball joint. It's like an actual hinge. And in this case, I'll just tell you that the hinges rotate around the Z axis. So they rotate like this. So this object here, when it, you know, if it gets caught on a bar right here, it's going to rotate around like this, you know, so the hinge is going that way. So if we want the hinge in this case to allow the mesh to bend like this, 
then we need to rotate all of these empties such that the Z axis is rotated accordingly. So if I just go in here and I just rotate these negative 90 degrees like this, then the Z axis is now horizontal. And if I put, hit Alt A, it immediately bends down and falls and is really, really cool. Now, one other thing you'll notice though, is that these objects are colliding with themselves. Well, we don't really want that. And the reason is, is because we have disable collision on. So this is just on by default to make it more, uh, make it faster and less uh, buggy. But if we just go in, we just disable this. And I don't want to copy this to all of them because uh, then I would be copying the objects as well. So unfortunately we need to do this one by one. But if I just disable these like this, and now I hit Alt A, now those objects will collide. They interact with each other, just like regular rigid bodies. And there we go. Now what's cool is we can even go in, we can play with this simulation while it's going. So for example, I can take this object, I can now move this around and play with it. I can toss the objects up in the air. I can grab them again, you know, really kind of whatever we want to do, we can go in and do exactly that. Now, one last thing that I'll show you is that we do have this breakable option. So let's just take this one. And if I click breakable, this threshold is then basically the amount of force or the impulse that's applied. And as soon as that impulse reaches that threshold, it's going to break the connection between these and allow it to then break apart. So if I just go like this, then it breaks it apart because that impulse, that force up was greater than 10. And so this is really, really cool. I can just like break objects apart and you can apply that for each one of these. And there is, I'm not, I don't know exactly what it is, but there is an add-on that you can get called rigid body tools, I think, or something like that. And basically allows you to connect a whole bunch of objects very, very quickly. And so you could use this breakable feature for all kinds of things. So like if you use say like the cell fracture add-on, you could then connect all of your shards with the connection constraints and then break them apart as an object hits such that it doesn't just all break apart at one time. Instead, you could go in and break individual pieces as they're hit based on the amount of force. So that's just a quick overview of the rigid body tools in Blender 2.66. They're an awful lot of fun to play with and give us a lot of new power that previously we weren't able to use inside Blender.